Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on December 13th. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program. So we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The mod list is in the video description. Our first mission was to launch a viewer-produced payload. This is the Halcyon capsule. And so my role is to design the launcher, whereas viewers submitted the payloads, and they pay struts, which is the in-stream currency, if you will, that you earn by watching the stream, in order to get it launched. And I have a, like, a launch form for it and all of that, so it costs a certain amount of struts depending on the mass and size of the payload. And here's my launcher, it is called the Kingfisher. It has a J2X second stage that is recoverable, and so uh, some of the apparatus there you see attached to it is meant to make it recoverable. Actually, the heat shield is tucked into the tank right now. We need to pull that out. You can see a procedural inner stage there. That I need to... There we go. Alright, that's all better. So you see the RCS that will deorbit it as well. Okay, well that's the second stage for you, and we want to bring that back. The first stage was an M1 engine, a hydrogen-oxygen burning engine. Highly efficient, 6,000 or so kilonewtons of thrust. Uh, here you see me removing crew from the Halcyon since we haven't tested it yet. It's just basic policy not to send the Kerbals up unless we're completely sure that the capsule is safe. So we'll be testing it out on this run. And anyway, uh, the M1 as you see there, a single M1 engine uh, powers this up. And the capacity for the rocket is 20 tons. And it gets to that because of the efficiency of both engines, the M1 and the J2X. Part of the beauty of this system is that with hydrogen oxygen engines, hydrogen and oxygen combine into water and that's what spews out the nozzle of the engines. And then if you can take water and then use solar power in order to split it apart into hydrogen and oxygen again to fuel the rockets, you've got sort of a closed cycle and it's green. It is, it is renewable, friendly, and all that stuff. Anyway, so here is the rocket. And of course I made the first stage tank black. Uh, even though it's a cryogenic tank and probably should not be that color, but hey, uh, it's cool that way. Alright, so here we go. Ignition. Alright, M1 is ignited and launch. There we go. Now, one problem with just having a single engine with no vernier thrusters is, of course, that we don't have roll control per se. On the bright side, the M1 does have gimbling. This is um, sea level configured M1. Uh, I should mention, the M1 was a real engine, but it was never actually used. Uh, so it was component tested, as they say, but it was never used in flight. So you can say it's, uh, it's a hypothetical engine. Now, I made the rocket without regard to the Halcyon specifically. So the rocket is meant for 5.5 meter payloads. The Halcyon is, of course, a little bit small, so it's sort of floating on top of the the upper inner stage there. Not the best sort of situation. And there we go. Now first stage set, and now the J2X is lit. That has about 1,100 kilonewtons or something around that range. I should mention that this Halcyon payload was created by user Aaronim on Twitch. And so uh, he put together the Halcyon pod, and it's really complicated. It's got three different kinds of RCS thrusters, three different kinds of comm, comm systems and stuff like that. The little thing on top is not an escape system, by the way. That is actually, and I, it took a long time for me to understand this, uh, because Aaron had to explain it to me, but uh, that's actually to create a soft landing on the ground. So that little tower on top actually comes back all the way down. So yeah. Okay, here we go, end of the second stage. Alright, and getting ready for a payload separation. Looks good, separating. And there you go, there is the Halcyon as it's meant to be. Docking port on the tail there. And it's also got advanced Gemini lander engines as its main uh, orbital maneuvering system. And you see me checking those there to check that the propellant is very stable so I can light them. So there, those are the advanced Gemini lander engines that were used for the OMS system. And the benefit of them is that they're throttleable. They're included in the FASA pack. They have throttling, they have infinite ignitions, and uh, yeah, so obviously 
a superior system altogether. You can see the solar panel configuration. Unfortunately, I didn't recall what uh, action group they were on, so I just activate, activated the menu. Oh, no, wait. I was having trouble using the action group. I, uh, it was action group to the lights, I remember now. Anyway, uh, we separate off the engine from the second stage so that we can return it and so there's a test of this system yeah for some reason on the halcyon pod the uh, remote tech was not having fun with it i don't know why but anyway here we go i bring it to a periapsis of zero kilometers i decide that uh, getting it just there would be a good place to start testing normally i get it to 75 kilometers or something like that okay here we go you can see the position of the heat shield and that's why we had that little fairing around it and all. Now it's not my intention to manually bring this down every time because it takes like uh, maybe an hour to bring uh, it through the atmosphere. Deorbiting stuff takes forever. I, I might be exaggerating an hour but it takes a while. But uh, yeah as long as I can prove that it works that's sufficient for me. Unfortunately it didn't work. And mysteriously uh, checking F3 here uh, it was a spontaneous combustion of the real fuel's tank, which should have been protected by the heat shield. There's clearly a bug at work here, and we'll discuss what that might be later on uh, for reasons you'll soon see. This was another viewer submitted payload. This was from Dialord Root, and this is the mono propaganda. I think we should just call it Beamer, because that's what he meant. Uh, he used BMW as a shorthand for Beamer, as in to beam something back. Uh, so anyway, that was the probe meant to beam propaganda to Mars for Martian consumption. So uh, yep, that's the that's the storyline behind it, and we're sticking to it. Okay, so I've made the uh, transfer stage, and the contract was to deliver it to Mars orbit. So I had to deliver uh, build the transfer stage there. Here I'm taking care of the Halcyon again, and we decided to do a re-entry test of it. So we're bringing it back down immediately. Periaps is 75 kilometers there. Uh, the reason I didn't launch the Ma Propaganda Beamer is because we don't have the right transfer point yet. Okay, so here we go. It does keep that tower on top because, again, that's supposed to help it have a soft landing. So we'll see how it does. Here at uh, 93 kilometers, you can see it's got the a little uh, temperature warning there and obviously a little bit red but so is everything in realism overhaul at this point I do get a little bit worried though so I activate the thermal data and we can see the skin temp there now getting to 1200 but that shouldn't be a huge problem unfortunately it was and uh, the whole thing will spontaneously combust in a few seconds and talking it over with Aaronim we decided that uh, it was my installation of real fuels and realism overhaul that might need a little bit of work. So I reinstalled everything for the December 20th stream and it, it, it does seem to work better. I at least tested the J2 stage returning. I haven't tested the Halcyon again yet. Here I'm trying to build a Neptune probe because that's the next transfer window that we have. Uh, but I decided ultimately to reconsider that. But anyway, uh, here I, I start to have a little bit of trouble in the VAB, a little bit of stickiness, so I decide to restart. And while the program is restarting, I uh, come up with an idea because I had seen a website regarding Apollo 17 that was very interesting. And so here I'll feature it for you as well. I'll go with the original audio from the stream because I dumped the music. So here we go. Listen in. Here, uh, this is Apollo17.org. I don't know if you guys have seen it or not, but uh, this guy put together all the things Apollo 17. And so you can watch the mission going on in real time because it occurred uh, during this week or so in uh, 1972. I guess uh, there's this join at one minute to launch thing. I hope it stays up uh, even when it's not the Apollo 17 All type boat. Oh. now aboard the second stage. Pressurize as we approach the okay, one minute mono. mark in the countdown. Mark T minus one minute and counting. Now in the final minute of the countdown. At T minus 45 seconds, Gene Cernan will make the final guidance alignment. This is the uh, 
eight mark. T minus five forty five. And Gene Cernan made that final guidance alignment. That's the last action taken by the crew aboard the space vehicle. Now approaching the half minute mark. T minus thirty three. Oh. T minus thirty seconds and continuing on. Oh, that's now. what they did. Continuing on at T minus twenty six second mark. T minus twenty five. You'll get a final guidance uh, release at the T minus seventeen second mark. I need to control your volume. 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8. Well, there's Gene Cernan, not Gene Prince. Started. All engines are started. We have ignition. 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. Roger, Gina, looking great. Press it all by the engine. Okay, baby, it's looking good. Here, roll is complete. We are pitching. That's special control, Gene Cern, reporting. Uh, launch vehicle, maneuvering to the proper attitude. Everything looking good at this point. 17 is go. Roger, Gina, looking good. First stage looks good. Altitude 1.1 1 .1 miles. Okay, one minute, 68 degrees, okay? Everything looks great over here, okay? Needs more. <laughs> okay, that one for me. Okay, video. Hey, Bob, what's my shadow length right now? Mission Control hey, got to control the camera on the rover. So that's the, most of the video we get is from the rover camera. We'll get it for you momentarily. So anyway, I'll leave you guys to uh, enjoy that on your own. I certainly will be. So for now, let's switch back to Kerbal. So I checked today and that website is still up. So you can go take a look at it and start at T minus one minute or you can skip around it has a little timeline. Anyway, I abandoned the Neptune probe because I decided that the best thing to do would be to wait for a slingshot opportunity with Jupiter because otherwise it takes too long to get to Neptune. So instead I build for the next transfer window, which is to Saturn. And we decided to go with uh, Titan Lander. So this is not a viewer submitted payload. This is one of my own. And uh, here I have the SS engine that will be uh, carrying the communication dish, the RTGs and everything. The Titan Lander is right on top there. Hopefully. I mean, uh, who knows if this is going to work or not. But it is a cute little lander. Okay. And yep. Everything is in order, then the huge transfer stage. The Estes engine is for getting into orbit around Titan and all that. This is the transfer stage with three RL-10s because I needed a center node to put the fairing on, the fairing base on. And we are launching this on the SLS Block 1C. Remember, the difference between Block 1C and Block 1B is I created a hypothetical J2X stage in place of the RL-10 stage that would exist for Block 1B. Otherwise, it's the same tanks and everything else. Okay, so here we go. SLS on the launch pad, on launch pad, unfortunately, in the dark. And that is, of course, because of the need to line up with the ecliptic. So here we go. And launch. All right, SRBs burning. Those are the five segment versions of the space shuttle SRBs, of course. And at the base of the SLS, we have four RS-25 space shuttle main engines. I keep forgetting to change the texture on the first stage tank there. Of course, now NASA has gone with an orange color to it, but I keep forgetting to change that in the subassembly. I can't get the little racing stripes on the boosters, unfortunately, but, well, I'll have to do without that for now. Uh, don't tell me about any mod that might have appropriately colored boosters, please. Here we're coming close to SRB separation, and of course we separate while they're still lit because it takes a while for them to actually lose all their thrust. They're tapering out now. We separate when their thrust goes to about full 100 kilonewtons. So here we go. 
and separate. Okay, very good. Otherwise, we'll be lugging the extra weight around, and you can see they're still flaming there. These probably go out much faster than the real Space Shuttle SRVs or five-segment versions of those. Okay, bearing separation, and there's our payload. Big orange tank for the three RL-10s. Smart ASS always has trouble controlling the Space Shuttle main engine, so I end up having to control it during this part. Alright, separation of the first stage, and the J2X is lit. And there we go. So, of course, I only replaced the RL-10s with J2X because this is quicker. The RL-10s are much more efficient. Okay, here we go, getting to orbit now, and we will be able to relight the J2X, only once though. The RL-10s relight 10 times, or potentially 10 times. Alright, there we go, high apoapsis, low periapsis. Now here is another user submitted payload. This is Better Tomorrow for Saturn by Tomasino. So this uh, probe is has the big dish you can see, and some scientific instruments and we are going to send this over to Saturn. I believe uh, specified any high orbit will do uh, sort of an exploration orbit, I believe was desired. And here I've got a little stage. There's a, that little stage is meant to get it into orbit around Saturn, and then the big stage below it was to handle the transfer. As you can see, I decided to go with the Kingfisher rocket in order to get it to orbit. But because it's 34 tons to low Earth orbit, I had to add boosters, and I chose the Ariane boosters because, frankly, they look great. And uh, I don't have too many other boosters in there. I'd have to use procedural SRVs otherwise. So here we go with two... And I'm lighting the Ariane boosters first, so the M1 does not light at this point. So just the SRVs first, and they do have gimbling, one of the benefits of these particular boosters. So, yep. Here we go, lighting the SRBs, and launch. Except I had a little bit of staging malfunction there with a launch clamp left over in a higher stage, so I had to quickly get that down and release it. Now we can launch. Alright, well, not the best thing, but still, at least we are off. So the benefit of uh, lighting the M1 later on is, of course, it starts out with a higher ISP at altitude. And we'll light it before the SRBs totally run out. But here we go. We are now well past the sound barrier, approaching max Q. And it's around here that I light the main engine. And we are getting ready to dump the boosters. You can see they taper off as well. But I'm waiting for 400 kilonewtons here, uh, uh, but weirdly, before they get to 400 kilonewtons, they suddenly go off. So I don't know how that works. But... Well, separation was successful, and we continue. And the stage about to run out. Did add two more minutes after SRB set. And here it goes. And now the J2A. Quick reconfiguration of the fairings so that we can separate the fairings now. And there you can now see the RL10 transfer stage, which is uh, quite huge, of course, if you're going to get all the way out to Saturn. And again, this probe has RTGs, which is how it gets its power. Anything beyond Jupiter, you need RTGs. Okay, and we are about to make orbit here. My apoapsis is getting a little bit out of hand, that's not good. What's our final orbit here? Uh, not too bad, 252 by 192, let's say, kilometers. And here I'm plotting for Saturn, and you can see a prograde burn of 7,412. Pretty much gets us there, but uh, a mid-course plane change is definitely advisable to get closer. I do try a few other things first, for instance, adding a bit of a normal burn to correct some inclination. You can see what I'm doing. I'm trying to move that path closer to Saturn. The little green dot in the middle there is Saturn. 
and I decide that that's not quite worth it at this point. I do plot the mid-course plane change instead, and that gets us a pretty close pass at Saturn. But in any case, the initial burn around Earth will already get us into Saturn SOI. But we certainly don't want to enter Saturn SOI with a really bad approach. We want to get as close to Saturn as possible to take advantage of its gravity. And that is because it makes a huge difference when it comes to getting to orbit. You cannot air brake at Saturn in 1.0.4. It's basically a brick wall with all the gas giants. So I don't even try. You can see it requires about 920 meters per second to get into a very loose orbit around Saturn after doing that kind of approach. So here we go, lighting the J2X again to start the burn for Saturn. And again, this is the Better Tomorrow's Probe from Tomasino. And the second stage of the Kingfisher is about to run out. And you see me checking the propellant stability on the RL-10 there. Okay. That looks good. So, stage separation. And ignition. Alright. RL-10 is ignited. And you can see it's got about 7,500 meters per second in that huge tank. And that's more than enough to complete this burn. Though not enough to cover the mid-course plane change. And its fuel can boil off and so that's a bit of a problem. I do a part of the burn and then go around the earth and then replot because otherwise we, we we typically couldn't do the entire burn at the same time it would deviate too much. Anyway so we are going to go around the earth and so I decide to take care of my other Saturn probe the Titan lander and get it on its way. You see he's still attached to the second stage of the SLS because it's got 2,400 meters per second left in it. That too a J2X by the way. Now this time because I have more fuel in cryogenic stages I need to make sure to do as much of the burn at Earth as possible not waiting for the mid-course plane change. And so that's why you see me plotting out not just the prograde part but also adding on radial and normal burns in order to get as close to Saturn with this burn as possible without relying on a mid-course plane change and that costs about a thousand meters per second more. And that's the end of the J2X stage. So I, oh, I use the little uh, separatrons and then I separate and ignite the stage with the three RL10s. Okay, here we go. And there you see why I opted for this a more substantial burn near Earth because this stage had 7,000 meters per second and anything left over from this stage would likely boil off uh, by the time we get to any mid-course plane change. So yeah, best just use as much of this stage as possible here. And so that's the plan and here you can see our approach shaping up. There we go, we've got uh, approach to Saturn but of course not the way I plotted it. And so I have to cut this burn short and replot. So here we go, get rid of that. And this is the replotted version. But it requires quite a lot more than I thought it would, so we were quite a bit off on the first burn. 1,600 meters per second is pretty bad. And we're actually going to have to use a bit of the next stage in order to do this. So I light the three RL10s again. Actually a little bit hastily because I wasn't directly in line with the maneuver node. And then separate. And this is an Estes engine as you see there. The upper stage of the Ariane rocket. And it's burning MMH and N204. That didn't work particularly well but I wanted to jump back to Better Tomorrows, the other Saturn probe. And so I just put a little uh, maneuver there just outside of the Kerbin SOI to adjust it then. Um, still have to try and bring it closer to Saturn. But anyway, here's Better Tomorrows and we're doing the second part of its burn. There we go, ignition of the RL-10. And this time we really do have to leave Earth SOI. We can't hang around anymore. So I'll have to do all this burn now. And obviously that's going to lead to some inaccuracies because it's such a long burn. 
Still, I do hit the maneuver node pretty close to halfway through the burn. Not exactly, but close enough so it's not too bad. Here you see, as this stage runs out, we're actually going to expend this stage and have to start off the next stage in order to actually get to Saturn. Here we're setting the fuel down, separating, and ignition of a Gemini lander engine. Since uh, I saw them at work on the Halcyon, I decided to use one here. And here, making the approach in five years to Saturn. We are now on the hypergolic stage, no fuel boil off, and I make the mid-course correction maneuver there at the descending node. We'll have to do that in a year and a half or so. Alright, and with this, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this recap of the Soul System Colonization livestream. And if you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.